Hi guys, uh, my name is Holly Baxter. I'm an accredited practicing dietitian and online physique coach. And today I'm going to talk to you about dietary fiber. Um, I have a lot of clients and people asking me um, how to track fiber, uh, how do I read labels on uh, food packaging, um, and what about the calories? Are there any calories? Should I count net fiber uh, and things like that? So let's start off with uh, the basics or the fundamentals. So what is dietary fiber? So it's also known as roughage, um, and it's a type of carbohydrate uh, found in plant-based foods, um, and it's made up from a number of sugar molecules that are linked together by specific bonds, they're called glycosidic bonds. Um, but unlike other carbohydrates, um, like starches, uh, dietary fiber is bound together in a way that uh, is not digestible by the small intestine. So humans lack the enzyme necessary to actually break this down. However, some types of dietary fiber, and I'll talk to you about that in a moment, um, can be digested by uh, the natural microflora um, or bacteria in the human gut. So, uh, what types of dietary fiber are in our food? So, typically we can look at these into two categories. Um, firstly, one is polysaccharides and the other is non-starch polysaccharides. So, I'll explain a little bit about both. So, polysaccharides are really large, long, uh, single sugar molecules bound together um, so these are also known as monosaccharides, mono being one. Um, and these are glycosidic leaches and they include things like cellulose, uh, hemicellulose, pectins, uh, gums, mucilages, things like this. So cellulose is the main constituent in plant cell walls and they are found in things like vegetables, fruits and uh, other legumes. So what are non-starch polysaccharides? So these include things like lignans and these are like the tough uh, woody part um, in plant-based foods. So an example of a non-starch polysaccharide would be the stringy fibrous bit that you might see in celery um, or the woody part of a banana um, if it was really unripe. Um, and other areas or other things that you might find um, non-starch polysaccharides would be fruits or the skins of fruits especially. So uh, if we look further than this, dietary fiber can then be split into soluble uh, or insoluble fiber. And most plant-based foods contain a good amount of both, um, but it is important to make sure that we include a variety of these in our diet. So uh, what is soluble fiber? Soluble fiber, uh, it dissolves in water. It forms a thick gel-like substance uh, in your stomach and it's really easily broken down by the gut bacteria in the large intestine and small intestine like I was talking about before. And it does actually provide us with a very small amount of energy. So for every gram of soluble fiber we digest, we actually take in around two calories per gram. Um, and you'll see certain uh, literature reference maybe two, some lit uh, literature will reference three, gram, uh, three calories per gram. So somewhere around that amount. Um, but primarily uh, soluble fiber is known for its role in heart health. Um, due to its ability to uh, lower or reduce our LDL cholesterol, our tri uh, triglycerides and total cholesterol. Um, but it's also important to understand that these heart health benefits uh, don't exist independently. Um, for example, if you had really poor dietary habits, um, you ate an excessive amount of calories, just simply by uh, including more fiber on its own, uh, it wouldn't have the same cardiovascular health benefits. So uh, these findings uh, correlate with a diet that uh, is calorie controlled and contains or incorporates modest amounts of protein, carbohydrates and fat. So soluble fiber dissolves in water and it will form a thick gel-like substance um, in the stomach. So an example of this would be uh, imagine when you put a bowl of oats or some rice um, and you leave it to sit for a little while or overnight um, and it kind of takes on that water. Uh, that is an example of soluble fiber and how it actually behaves in our stomach. So it's really easily broken down by the bacteria in the large intestine too. So uh, this being said, it actually is able to provide us with a small amount of calories and the literature will say uh, various things when you see how much calorie, how much uh, energy is provided but typically in the realm of two to three or two to 2.5 uh, calories per gram um, of fiber. So it is about half of what is actually provided by carbohydrates or even protein, uh, but it's definitely not calorie free. Um, primarily, uh, soluble fiber is known for, for its role in heart health, um, and that's due to its ability to actually lower our LDL cholesterol, 
and our triglycerides and our total cholesterol. Um, so, but it is important to understand that um, these heart health benefits don't exist independently. So uh, just to give you an example, um, if your dietary habits are really poor um, and you eat excessive amount of calories, just by simply eating or consuming more fiber on its own, um, won't actually give you these same cardiovascular health benefits. And this finding um, would correlate with a diet that is controlled for calories um, and incorporates modest amounts of protein, uh, fats, and carbohydrates. Um, so yeah, just eating more fiber is not going to help you out here in that, in that case. So how does soluble fiber actually work to, to give us these protective um, health benefits or cardiovascular health benefits especially? Firstly, it slows down the digestive process by delaying gastric emptying. So as a result, it helps us to feel fuller for longer, which is why our dietary fiber is known for its um, positive um, role in weight management. Um, and the, this is also the reason why fiber has a role in nutritional management of type 2 diabetes, because it's able to slow down um, the rate at which carbohydrate is absorbed into our bloodstream. So as a result, um, it can help regulate our blood uh, glucose levels and prevent those rapid rises in blood sugar uh, after a carbohydrate containing meal. Um, the other thing that soluble fiber does is it increases the excretion or the removal of uh, bile acids. So it binds to these bile acids in the small intestine and actually helps to eliminate cholesterol um, and other waste products from the body, um, as well as decreasing uh, liver cholesterol production as well. So now let's have a look at insoluble fiber. Uh, this doesn't dissolve in water as it passes through our gast gastrointestinal tract. In fact, it stays relatively intact. Um, so it's therefore not typically thought of as a source of calories. Um, these uh, have a role in our, in our digestive health um, by their ability to alleviate things like constipation. Um, <laughs> hey, but I talk about this every day with clients and patients, so it's okay. Uh, but it also helps to reduce the risk of things like hemorrhoids um, and other diseases of the gastrointestinal tract. And as I mentioned before, uh, fiber has a role in type 2 diabetes and so does insoluble fiber. And again, it has the same type of uh, protective measures in that it decreases the likeliness of somebody uh, who perhaps is pre-diabetic um, from progressing to the more serious um, type 2 diabetes, again, because of its role in uh, blood sugar regulation. So um, it slows down the absorption of those carbohydrates, um, and as a result, um, you can see decreases in um, blood sugar levels, um, and then obviously the demand for insulin is uh, less as well. So how does insoluble fiber actually work? Well, as I've mentioned, its primary role is in regulating gut motility. So it actually increases uh, the bulk of our stool, to be honest. Um, and this is a, and this obviously helps to prevent constipation. Um, this type of dietary fiber is also strongly correlated with uh, those feelings of fullness. So. Um, insoluble fiber is widely recognized as being beneficial for long-term uh, weight management. Uh, the final thing that I will say about insoluble fiber is that it has a role in lowering uh, blood pressure uh, as well as inflammation. So where can we actually find dietary fiber? Um, fairly well recognized fruits and vegetables and again as I've mentioned depending on the type of fiber um, it's either found in the skins or it could be found in the actual inside of the fruit or the vegetable so some good examples would be beans legumes peas um, fruits vegetables as well as nuts and seeds um, and if we start to think about whole grains whole grain cereals whole wheat flour um, and products like brown rice and whole grain breads and pastas, uh, they're going to be your products that are higher in uh, both kinds of fiber. And in fact, if you generally eat more of these foods, you are going to be eating um, more of both types of fiber as a result anyway. So um, I will talk about the recommended amounts. So one of the things that I always am asked by particularly new clients who haven't got a huge amount of experience with nutrition and dieting, um, but they, they ask me about breakfast. Is it really the most important meal of the day? Because I always, if I eat breakfast, I find that I'm still really hungry uh, later in the day, so it's just better if I don't eat it at all. So what I would say to that question 
um, is it's more than likely due to the type of carbohydrate that you're consuming. So if your breakfast contains highly refined, low fiber, low protein foods, then undoubtedly you're probably going to feel a little bit hungrier late in the day. So for example, if you have white bread with jam or rice bubbles with milk and that's it, some sugar sprinkled over the top, your digestive system is going to break these down and process them relatively quickly and of course leave you feeling hungry. So in order to help minimize these feelings, um, try to include a breakfast cereal with at least three grams of dietary fiber per serve or more. And then uh, if you can, add a protein source. So whether that is just a regular you know, uh, cow's milk, um, which is going to be a provider of protein, um, you could also have a protein smoothie or something like that made up with a protein supplement um, or have a hot breakfast with eggs and things like this to ensure that you are having um, protein and dietary fiber. So some other quick and simple ways to increase your daily fiber intakes, obviously looking for those whole grains um, listed on the food packages. So some examples of whole grain foods would be uh, barley, buckwheat, brown rice, millet, bulgur, quinoa, rolled oats, there's a whole long list of these types of foods that are going to be good providers of fiber. Um, and just so that you know, also the ingredients are listed uh, in descending order by weight. So the closer that that particular food is listed to the beginning of the list, um, the more of that ingredient will be in that particular food. So um, that's a little tip to, to check out when you're reading the nutrition panel um, of food products. Obviously switching over from those more refined carbohydrate sources to whole grain sources if you can. If you're having white bread, swap over to brown bread. If you're having regular pasta, white pasta, uh, swap to the whole grain version. And same for rice, you can go from white rice to brown rice um, or some of the combinations of um, rices that also have quinoa and other oats and grains. Um, that's not a bad idea either. Um, limit your consumption of typically uh, refined food products. So things that are made with flour, so cakes, chips, muffins, crackers, they're all, um, not only are these typically an, uh, an excess source of calories, um, they will also have a lot of sugar, a lot of fat, and also added sodium. So um, removing some of those from your diet is not going to be a bad, a bad thing in terms of your overall health um, and your ability to hit your daily fiber intake. Final suggestion that I would is uh, would say is to add things like beans and legumes um, to your diet. So kidney beans, black beans, pinto beans. You can put these in like mince dishes, especially or soups. Um, I add them to bolognese and lasagna. Uh, if I'm making like taco mince, I'll just add in a whole can of black beans or lentils or something like that. Um, they're easy to, easily disguised. Um, they kind of take on the flavor of the food that you're cooking with. Um, and then you can hide them from people that <laughs> perhaps are not so keen on the idea. So that's something else. Uh, and finally, adding um, nuts and seeds in replace of um, some of your meats and poultry. That's not a bad way uh, to help achieve your daily protein intake, uh, but also incorporate a little bit of dietary fiber as well. If you have any questions about this, um, please stay uh, tuned and continue listening to the part two of this video series as I will be discussing uh, labeling, so how dietary fiber is actually labeled on nutrition panels of food products. Um, and if you have any questions or would like to inquire about nutrition coaching, you are more than welcome to contact me. Uh, you can head straight to my website. I'm going to list it here for you. It is www.hbnutrition.com.au. Uh, if you follow me along on social media or you would like to follow me along on social media, my Instagram is Holly T Baxter. And I'm hoping you're watching this on YouTube. So subscribe to my channel, like, share if it's useful. Uh, and I look forward to uh, speaking to you again shortly. Have a great day.